I'm Deborah from Dive Planet Travel, and I'm joined by David Casalino from the Australian Marine Conservation Society, and Gemma Craig, who has um, literally grown up on the Great Barrier Reef and is here to share um, some unique experiences that you can have on the Great Barrier Reef. So we'll start off by showing you just how wonderful the reef is today. Over to you, Gemma. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm just going to show you a video that I've been, uh, I finished this year, and it's just kind of a summary of uh, my experience on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this. Thank you. 
Wow, that was just beautiful. Thanks for that, ladies and gents. Um, so that's just sort of a summary of, you know, the wonders that you can see on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, we do have a presentation to go through um, some of the, the sort of highlights um, or the must-see areas of the reef. Um, and so some of the things that we saw in that video, we will talk about uh, in this presentation. If you want to play that, Deb. Okay, what we wanted to go through today was some of the unique experiences that you can have on the Great Barrier Reef. These are um, experiences you can't have anywhere else, really. And um, we thought a great place to start would be um, uh, the, the, the dwarf minke whale experience. So Gemma, can you tell us a bit about that? So uh, dwarf minke whales, they're a really, really interesting animal. And uh, I think they they migrate up the east coast of Australia in the, in the winter time. So we see them uh, between May to maybe late Ju uh, July. And they're a really, really curious whale. Uh, and they'll actually come swimming up to dive boats in the area and just stay there for hours to just kind of check out um, who we are and what we're doing there. So a lot of uh, the companies that operate in the Northern Great Barrier Reef, they run minke whale trips. So you don't even have to actually be a, um, a certified scuba diver to see these whales because you can see them just um, snorkeling. Uh, now, the way that they do it is they run big, long lines off the back of the boats and um, the, the guests hop in the water and, you know, you're wearing a mask and a snorkel and you just hold on to the rope and the whales will already be in the area and they'll just be circling right underneath you and they'll stay with you for, for hours and hours and hours at a time. Sometimes the boat actually has to leave the whales. Um, they just love people for some reason. Um, they get really curious about um, what we are and... Uh, throughout the encounters, you'll notice that the whales start to get closer and closer and closer to you. So you might have, you know, a group of, um, sometimes you can get up to 14 whales um, in one big group at a time. So you'll be at the surface looking down and you honestly don't know where to look because there's just so many whales all around you uh, circling and um, they're, they're, they'll also display some really interesting behaviour. Uh, they'll do belly presentations or bubble blasts, um, something called motorboating, which is where they come up to the surface and they, they kind of just like hop. Um, they, they stick their nose out and they just sort of hop along the surface. Um, and some other really interesting behaviour as well. But, yeah, they're just so curious and they just want to know what you are. So they'll get closer and closer and closer. You could almost touch them, honestly. That It's just amazing to be in the water with something that big um, and for it to be, you know, so calm and gentle, um, um, gentle around people. Yeah, so it's really quite a spectacular encounter. Great for photos as well because they come so close to you. And so um, during the minke whale season, there are a few dive liverboards um, that do special minke whale trips that just focus on the ribbon reefs, including um, Mike Ball Dive Expeditions and um, Diver's Den. Um, Spirit of Freedom. And so if you want to find out more about that, you can hop over to the Dive Planet booth and um, Simon can help you with some information there. Um, the next experience we were going to talk about was Rain Island. Now, Rain Island is the largest turtle um, rookery on the Great Barrier Reef. I think this year they estimated around over 600,000 um, hatchlings. Um, on the island, but um, Gemma can tell you more about the diving experience there. Right, so I've seen um, a lot of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, I grew up uh, on Green Island, which is about an hour out of Cairns, so I've spent plenty of time diving uh, all the way from the north near Rain Island to the southern area. And I have to say, Rain Island is just one of those places that uh, it, it's different than all the rest, and I, it, 
it's a really unique place. Now, uh, as Deb was saying, it's um, it's a turtle rookery, and it does it actually sees about seventy percent of the world's um, green turtle species. They come and nest there on Rain Island um, in the summer months. So, to give you an idea of what it's like to go to Rain, uh, now it's it's really in the very northern section of the Great Barrier Reef, and it is quite um, it's quite hard to get there. Uh, you have to have a special permit because it's um, it's a marine park and it's um, it's very protected by the government. So they don't want you know everyone coming and visiting it all the time. But they allow certain boats to uh, have a, a dive permit for one day or a few days um, in the summer months. And so what happens is you'll you'll pull up to the island and it's really quite a fantastic looking island because it's just a it's a little sand cave. There's nothing on it. Uh, I think there's a, a lighthouse or um, a small building for research, and there's birds everywhere. So it's a you know it's a bird rookery as well as many many nesting birds, seabirds there. And when you get closer and closer, even just looking at the island from the boat, you'll see all of these um, these shapes climbing up the beach. And, and if you get binoculars or if you have a closer look, you'll realise that they're all turtles all the way along. So hundreds and hundreds of turtles climbing up out of uh, the, the water onto the sand to lay their eggs. Uh, now, when you go into the water, um, you'll start at one section of the reef, and the, you know, the, the most furthest section from the island itself, and you'll just dive uh, in a straight line heading in one direction along the reef. Now, I mean, there's turtles everywhere. Honestly, everywhere you look, you'll see a turtle, and each turtle that you see is the biggest turtle that you have ever seen. They are massive, 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 massive green turtles, the biggest turtles I've ever seen. Um, and as you're diving along, I mean, you don't, after a while, you kind of, you stop looking at the turtles and you start looking at the reef. And the reef is just so incredible uh, that you sort of forget about the turtles for a little while. Uh, now, it's a really, really interesting structure. It's all, um, it's all hard coral. It's very little soft coral. And it's all running kind of vertically down uh, the reef slope. So it's all sitting in the same direction. Um, if you can see in the photograph that I've got next to the turtle uh, in the slide, that's kind of what the reef shape looks like. And it's, it's all in that same direction all the way along the reef. Must be as the water is running out of the shallow, uh, the shallow sea flat, it sort of forms. Um, so there's enough nutrients kind of coming past it. And because of this unique structure, uh, there's not an empty gap. The whole reef is healthy, alive. Uh, it's probably about, you know, between 80 to 100% um, of coral coverage. And it's just the most incredible corals. So much colour, purples and greens and orange, and it's so bright. And it's right really close to the surface, so you don't even need to dive down deep um, to see this incredible reef. Now, apart from the turtles and the incredible reef, uh, it also drops off, drops off um, to quite deep depths. So there is some swim throughs and caves down a bit deeper. And because of that depth, you also get uh, some of the larger pelagic animals coming in as well. So there is an opportunity to see um, some bigger sharks, um, grey reef sharks, sometimes silver tip reef sharks. Um, and on occasion, you do get tiger sharks there as well. Uh, now, the tiger sharks will come in to feed on the, um, the carcasses of the dead turtles. Uh, and because of these turtles are laying eggs, you know, they're very, very exhausted. They've come from all around the world. So some of them don't survive. Um, and now tiger sharks are not, um, they're, they're kind of like a scavenger. So they'll be feeding off of the turtle, car uh, turtle carcasses that they see floating around on the surface. So yeah, Rain Island is definitely one of those places um, that it's a once in a lifetime experience and I'll never forget it. And I, I hope I get to go back there again one day. Wow. Um, so the next experience we thought we'd share with you is um, on the Osprey Reef, which is in the Coral Sea, and um, it's famous for the shark experience there. So, um, Gemma, I'll see if I can play this video and um, get you to talk about that. Maybe just mute yourself there, Deb, so they don't hear your sound. Um, I, I can't. Just turn the sound off on the video then, I suppose. 
So this is um, from one of my trips to um, Osprey Reef on, that I did on my ball dive expeditions, which is one of the big liverboards. Um, it's actually the company I used to work for. And on this particular expedition, we visited a sand cave. And then what you can see here is um, this is the beginning of where we did our shark feed dive. Now, Osprey Reef itself is a really, really interesting um, section of reef. And you might have heard about it in the David Attenborough um, Great Barrier Reef documentary. But it's a deep sea coral reef, which means that it drops off to um, thousands and thousands of metres uh, in some um, between the coast of Australia and Osprey Reef, there's probably about 3,000 metres of depth um, along that area. So it is a really, really deep reef, um, sort of rising up out of the depths to the surface. So it kind of acts like an oasis for all of the um, animals that live in the area. So you do get um, a huge amount of sharks coming to that area in particular. Uh, now, Osprey Reef, because it is so deep, it's pretty different to the rest of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, now, the Great Barrier Reef itself is sitting on the edge of the continental, uh, sorry, it's on the continental shelf. So, you know, max depth that you find is about 50 metres. Um, but then once you drop off of the edge of that continental shelf, you have very, very deep water. Uh, and that's when you see the coral sea reefs such as Osprey Reef that we're looking at here. Now, because of those, um, that depth and that open ocean, we get huge currents uh, coming on either point of Osprey Reef. Um, and because of that, yeah, there's a huge amount of pelagic action. So a lot of things like to sit in those current lines uh, and sharks in particular. And so what we do is we do do um, a shark feed where we uh, will rig up some tuna heads to a, um, a chain and a bin, and then we'll have all the divers seated in the area. And then when we're ready, we'll open up that bin and you'll see the tuna heads pop out on the chain and the sharks will just start going nuts on these tuna heads. And it kind of looks like a big whirlwind of sharks because there is so many of them in the water. Uh, now, the sharks kind of know when the boat gets to the reef that it means that they're going to be fed. So they'll always sort of be in, in the area as soon as the boat arrives. So you never go to Osprey Reef without seeing um, a bunch of sharks, honestly. There's so many of them there. Um, now, usually we get grey reef sharks. So that's the sharks that's photographed in the... Um, this PowerPoint there. Uh, and the grey reef shark, they probably get maybe about two metres to two and a half. So they're, you know, they're a, a kind of pretty regular, not a very aggressive uh, reef shark. Um, but they're the typical shark shape. So they've got that big torpedo shaped body. Uh, we also get silver tips. Now, silver tips can, their, their average would be about three metres in size uh, for a decent size, size silver tip. And they tend to be a little bit more aggressive uh, and certainly more curious as well. So they'll come past and, and check out divers and sort of see what's going on. Um, now, you need to remember with sharks, you never have to be afraid of sharks uh, because they don't know what divers are. They don't know what we are when they see us. We probably look pretty weird to a shark. You know, we've got bubbles coming out and we're, we look like we can't really swim very well. Um, so sharks definitely, they're probably more scared of us than we are of them. So we don't have to be afraid of sharks. It's really quite a cool in, interaction because we're looking at them just as curious as what they're looking at us. Now, Osprey Reef, you can also see so many other things. It's definitely a, a dive site um, worth visiting. Well, I, I say dive site, but it's actually an enormous reef with many, many dive sites on it. And they all drop off to the absolute abyss. And because of that deep water, you get a totally different dive experience um, than anywhere else, really. Uh, and hammerheads, you know, you can definitely see hammerheads at Osprey Reef as well. Um, I saw a school of 30 plus hammerheads, um, just like you see in the Galapagos. Um, at Osprey Reef. So, yeah, definitely a dive site um, worth checking out and very, very sharky. Okay. Um the next dive site that we wanted to talk about was um, the Yungala, which is a 100-year-old wreck just south of Huntsville. So, Gemma, can you tell us about that? So, the Yungala, um, it's, it's a shipwreck that um, 
it's a really interesting place because just like Osprey, it's almost become um, an oasis for all of the marine life that's living in the surrounding area. There isn't a nearby reef, so the Yongala, the wreck itself, attracts uh, a huge amount of fish life and, and marine animals. Now, the Yongala, um, when it sank, um, it was actually really quite an interesting and um, kind of tragic story. So it was um, traveling from Melbourne to Cairns and ran into a cyclone um, south of Townsville. It had 122 people aboard and all 122 of those people perished um, during that, uh, that wreck. So traces of the ship um, weren't found for a few days and when they um, found the, sh the shipwreck, it's, it had believed that the hull itself had been ripped open um, by a submerged rock. So it must have um, got caught into this cyclone and it just ran aground uh, or ran onto this rock that they didn't see. So pretty tragic um, story, but it makes for an absolutely incredible um, dive site. And you will see uh, some of the the most, uh, I, can't, I can't get the word, but it's the most, I guess, dense, the most dense marine life in concentrated in one spot. Uh, you'll get massive bull rays, marble rays, uh, turtles everywhere. You know, there'll be guitar sharks and reef sharks, you'll get sea snakes uh, and some of the biggest fish that you've ever seen. So it attracts the Queensland groper, uh, which is the largest of the groper species. So they're about the size of a small car. And because they kind of hang out on the shipwreck, they're pretty much guaranteed to be there as soon as you dive it. And because they're used to divers, you can get pretty close to them. So it's just one of those sites that um, the whole wreck itself is pretty much encrusted in coral now. So it's really good for photos and just the amount of life concentrated in that one area. Um, it's a fantastic dive site. It's definitely a must do if you're diving the Great Barrier Reef. Okay, um, moving from north to the very southern tip of the Great Barrier Reef um, is Lady Ellie Island, which is unique for um, a whole different reason. Um, so, um, Gemma, I might pay, play the um, video first and then we can um, talk about what's so unique about Lady Ellie Island. Yes, no problem. Uh, so Lady Elliot Island, one of the most, I guess, one of the uh, reasons it's the most famous is because of the manta rays that you can see um, at Lady Elliot. Uh, and in this particular encounter in the video that we're playing you now, it's a little bit um, laggy, but anyway, you get the picture. So there's a bunch of photographers here. Um, we were shooting some of these manta rays for a film um, called The Great Barrier Reef 3D. So you might have witnessed, you might have seen there's a massive camera there that's about the size of um, a table and that's actually a 3D camera. So it shoots in IMAX or 3D. Uh, now what's happening in the, in the video here, you'll see that there's a manta ray that's just sort of hovering above one of the divers. Uh, now this particular manta, you might notice underneath on its belly, it's got a remora or a sucker fish, which is sort of a pesky little critter that likes to hang underneath um, big animals and catch a free ride around the reef and they've got um, a suction cap on the top of their heads which they can just suck onto the bottom. It doesn't hurt the host animal but it might just be a little bit annoying. So in this circumstance this manta ray is actually clever enough to uh, realise that the bubbles from the diver might tickle the remora so that it swims away. You can see the remora is changing um, its position there. Now what makes um, this particular encounter so awesome is that the, the diver that the manta ray landed on, um, her name is um, Amelia Armstrong and she is the uh, actual founder of the manta ray pro um, project. So she uh, has a charity and she does, she's the primary researcher of um, manta rays here in the Great Barrier Reef. So yeah, really quite a cool encounter and you know that was just, that's something that 
um, I only have done one trip there and that happened on my one trip. So it's it's kind of a, a pretty common occurrence for the manta rays at Lady Elliot to come really, really close to divers because um, there's just so many of them there and they are used to now, um, growing up on an island, I suppose, I guess I have a pretty high standards for um, how, you know, how good an island is, how nice the coral is. Um, and I would have to say that Lady Elliot is one of the most magical places um, that I've ever been uh, because you kind of go on this journey when you get in the water. So you'll, you'll go for a snorkel or you'll go for a dive. Uh, and you'll see, you know, a turtle. So you'll start following the turtle and it'll take you for a little while until it takes you to a school of eagle rays. So you'll start following the eagle rays um, and they'll take you to the sharks who will take you to the mantas. Um, and there's just endless things for you to see. So you sort of go on this um, amazing underwater journey um, with all okay. of these creatures. Uh, Gemma, I think we'll... Um we should, uh, we're running out of time, so um, we might switch screens and share, um, get David to share his uh, presentation now so we can talk about um, uh, the threats to the reef and, and how people can can help. So um, I'll just come out of here. So I think that's my go. I will get going. Thanks so much, um, Deb and Gemma, for sharing the stage with me today. Um, and so yeah, just briefly, so I'm David Casalino from the Australian Marine Conservation Society, and I'm a campaigner with our Fight for Our Reef campaign. So we know that our beautiful reef is just most, one of the most stunning ecosystems in the entire world, um, and um, huge threats. And so this is, um, you know, kind of a bit of a capture of where things are at. So, you would know that climate change is a threat. In 2020, we had the third mass coral bleaching in just five years. Uh, Terry Hughes is one of the eminent scientists who um, took the aerial surveys this year, and it was really patchy. So we saw in certain parts, you know, huge stress as temperatures got to record levels in the Great Barrier Reef, and other parts, thankfully, escaped, like out from Cairns, where a lot of the tourists go to discover the reef for the first time. So in 2020, you know, we saw um, huge swathes on the northern outer reef really escape bleaching this year. However, uh, they were bleaching for the first time in the southern section of the reef that had been previously spared. And we know that bleaching doesn't necessarily mean the corals die. Um, bleaching is a stress event, and if the if the coral if the waters around the coral return to normal, uh, the microalgae can get back into the corals and they can continue living. Um, however, um, there was you know we've had a lot of severe bleaching. And so um, there's been lots of studies done and the International uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reported in 2018 about projections about what's going to happen to reefs, not just here in Australia and the Great Barrier Reef, but all across the world if we don't get a handle on climate change. And so they, were, they projected that if we see two degree rise in uh, temperatures, we're going to lose nearly 100% of the world's coral reefs. And that's why doing everything we can to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees is fundamentally important to give our reef and coral reefs around the world the best chance for the future. And that's what we're pushing our governments to do. Um, but what's been incredible to see over just the last few years is the real revolution in renewable energy that's going on. The so moving away from the dirty coal, gas and oil of the past and embracing clean renewable energy. We've seen in countries around the world and here in Australia, we've been able to push our governments to invest in renewable energy, uh, which has always been, you know, in, in partnership with amazing tourism operators and dive travel experts like Deb and Emma. So uh, you know, it's a real good effort coming together to create change. And, you know, I just want to leave you with the note that it's not too late to save our reef. Um, it's physically possible to, you know, reduce emissions quickly and uh, embrace those new energy solutions. And we just need everyone to do their part. And I think two things that you can do from wherever you are in the world is to come visit the Great Barrier Reef when you can. Obviously, COVID put a stop to immediate travel, but come visit and discover this place and fall in love with it and go home and get active on climate change um, in whatever way you can. Join a group, join a campaign locally to push your government, to push businesses, to embrace renewable energy. Um, and if you want, you can go to our website, pipefireef.org.au, and we can give you some more information about what's happening with the Great Barrier Reef and you know, petitions and other actions that you can do. Thanks, David. 
Um, and if you want to find out more about coming to see the Great Barrier Reef, come and visit um, Dive Planet in our booth and um, we can tell you how to see all of these or how to experience all of these unique um, Great Barrier Reef experiences. And um, yeah, we hope to see you on the reef very soon. Mm -hmm.